Like many craft artists, I've always had an interest in other craft arts. And like many craft artists, I find there is often opportunity for crossover both in materials and techniques. We'll learn more about that in around class 10 when we play with alternative materials. For now, we'll be using textile alternative materials as reactive materials for our patinas. Alternative materials? Anything not metal or stone is considered an alternative material. So bone, wood, resin, wool fibers, plastic, ceramics, anything really. Sea glass, hemp, found objects, tin cans can be used to make jewelry. Textiles, also known as the fiber arts, are a particular interest of mine, so I couldn't resist trying out a few textile bits and bobs. You may have noticed the green yarn I've been using to wrap my patinas up in. Well, eventually I started thinking, I wonder what would happen if I... So I moistened a bit of yarn with one teaspoon of ammonia. I also cooked up a second sample using one teaspoon of an ammonia salt solution, squeezed until damp, and wrapped, and wrapped, and wrapped, a little bit more, a little more, bit some more wrapping, some more wrapping, a bit more, around a bit of copper. Popped into a zip bag, a little rub rub, a little pat pat, and let cook for four days. Unwrapped, unwrapped, and unwrapped all of that yarn. Then washed in warm water, and the result? Quite the difference between the two. I can see real potential for this patina. Why? I would imagine different yarns will yield different results. What kind of yarn are you using? I'm afraid I'm not sure what this yarn is as it was given to me, but I would guess a wool polyester blend. Why would the type of yarn matter? I should think different fibers will absorb the ammonia differently and offer up a range of results. Why change the ammonia delivery method? Yeah, why not just wrap, tie, and drizzle? Actually, that's a very good question. Initially, I did wrap a bit of dry yarn around a bit of copper and then wrapped, tied, and drizzled, but was very disappointed in the results. So I decided to try a different ammonia delivery method, one where there would be more direct contact between the ammonia, yarn, and copper. Although wrapping, tying, and drizzling is not my favorite delivery method for yarn, there is something in this patina that wants to come out. Perhaps playing with cook times and more or less ammonia might yield more of what this patina wants to be. Needless to say, this patina is worth exploring, but I'll leave that for you to play with. Remember that bit of observation I tucked behind my ear to explore later? Yes. Well, eventually it started making some noise. It wanted to know, can cloth be used as a reactive material? Naturally, I started with the microfiber dishcloth used to wrap up my patinas. I soaked a bit of cloth in an ammonia salt solution, squeezed until damp, made a cloth copper cloth sandwich, popped into a zip bag, and let cook for four days. I also dug through my cloth pile and cooked up some samples using a printed cotton cloth, a loose weave synthetic cloth, a tight weave synthetic cloth, a wool felt cloth, a bit of J cloth, and a heavy textured upholstery of unknown fiber cloth. After cooking for four days, I let soak in warm water for about 15 minutes. Carefully removed the cloth from the top and carefully removed the cloth from the bottom. And the results? Um, I'm really sorry, but the film is very poorly lit. You can hardly even tell what's going on with that patina. It's so dark. If you enroll as a first-year student and support my Kickstarter project, I'll be able to hire a camera person who knows how to light a scene properly and can even keep everything in focus. All the time! Just imagine, what would that be like? In focus and well-lit all the time! I thank you in advance, as I am looking forward to having everything in focus and well-lit all the time. The patina is a tinsy bit chalky, 
so I gave it a final gentle wash in warm water. And the result? What a lovely dark blue. Heavy, heavy texture. Note to self. Next time, soak in water longer as some of the patina stuck to the cloth and was pulled off. Maybe try one hour next time? Very microfiber dish clothy. There's definitely a connection between the microfiber dishcloth and the patina texture. The printed cotton cloth did yield an image beyond texture and one which was obviously related to the printed image, but did not affect the color of the patina. No red dye transference. After much thought, it occurred to me that the ink used on the surface of the cloth clogged up the weave of the cloth and in essence acted as a resist, which gave me a thought which led me to lace which made me wonder, with its positive and negative space, what would happen if I covered, sprayed, and fumed a bit of lace? Ooh, we'll put that thought aside for now. No! It was a dark and stormy night. What a wonderfully moody, atmospheric patina, and wholly unexpected. But if you look closely, the stars in the night were created by the little white nubbins in the cloth. Not too much joy here, but there's clear evidence that the patina wants to form, so maybe playing with longer cook times could yield up better results. And maybe making sure the contact between copper and cloth is a good one. The more I look at this patina, the more I like it. Although it's quite dark, there are many layers of dark and light blues, dark and light greens, bits of purple and black. Again, we see a definite relationship between the cloth used, felt wool, and the resulting patina textures. I wonder what raw wool will produce. And the J-cloth? Well, not my favorite, but the heavy textured upholstery made up for it. The highs and lows of the heavy textured upholstery have formed strips of alternating patina effects. I was having so much fun, I decided to see what ammonia, all by itself and cloth, would do. What a lovely range of colors and textures. I wonder what wrapped, tied, and drizzled cloth would look like, but I'll leave that up to you. Time to explore that thought about lace. Yes, well first, this happened. And then, this is what happened. And then this happened. And in the end, this is what happened. I'm quite happy with what happened, so much so I gave two more bits of lace a try. It would appear lace makes an excellent patina resist, although the results will differ depending on how tight or loose the weave is, as well as copper to lace contact, not to mention how wet or how dry the patina is. Let's have a look at lace sample number two. In some areas, the weave is just too tight. The ammonia can't get in to do its thing, but it created a nice contrast between patina and bare copper highlighting the image in much of the same way as the tight and loose areas in the weave are used to define the flower image in the lace itself. Lace sample number three has some areas of tight weave, but also has raised areas which make it difficult for the lace to make contact with the copper. A little pokey pokey after spraying the ammonia salt solution would help to increase lace to copper contact. And just for fun, I cooked up one last sample Three very different yet similar patina effects. Why is that? Good question. I think these three samples illustrate nicely the touchiness of patina making. It would seem the smallest change in a patina recipe will have an effect on the results. Something to keep in mind when playing with lace. Paper is considered a fiber art as it's made with fibers. Upon reflection, I should have used some nice fibery handmade paper, but the inspiration for using watercolor paper came during a lecture I was giving on using watercolor paper in roller printing. What's roller printing? 
Roller printing is using a rolling mill to create embossed patterns, images, and textures in metal. We'll learn all about roller printing, hammer marks, punches, and etching in and around Class 3, the introduction to textures, images, and pattern making. As I was explaining the versatility of watercolor paper in roller printing as an image maker, I thought, I wonder if watercolor paper could be used as a resist in patina making. So I cooked up a sample using a paper towel fume chamber and a salt ammonia solution, which I let cook for two hours. Then let dry for one hour. As the watercolor paper stuck to the copper, I soaked it in warm water for about 15 minutes, at which point the watercolor paper came off easily without pulling the patina off with it. And the results? A whole new world of image making suddenly opened up. Very exciting! You know I had to stay and play. I made a whole bunch of samples. I cooked a second sample, this time for three hours, then let dry for about ten minutes. Carefully, with tweezers, removed the watercolor paper. There was a lot of liquid. So much so, I was concerned the lovely blue heart which had just formed would end up wiped out by the now spreading patina liquid. But the patina liquid formed into a bright robin egg blue mixed with a purple haze. Just a bit of the heart was covered, which gave the patina an overall look of swirly, watery movement, which I quite like. Where did all the patina liquid come from? It was hiding under the watercolor paper. Remember, I only let the patina dry for about 10 minutes, not enough time to let the patina liquid, or juice, dry. The removal of the watercolor paper released the trapped patina juices, which swarmed and swirled around the heart while they dried, unlike sample one, which had one hour to dry, giving the patina juices plenty of time to dry. Next, I cooked a bit of copper in a paper towel fume chamber for four days. I was hoping to add a bit of green, quickly so as not to let the base patina dry, but carefully I placed a positive watercolor heart on the base patina, sprayed two pumps of an ammonia salt solution, let cook for two hours, and let fully dry. As the watercolor paper stuck to the copper, I soaked it in warm water for about 10 minutes, at which point the watercolor paper came off easily and let fully dry. The result? Well, I did get a bit of green, but decided to cook up two more samples to see if I could get more green. I started with a base patina, which first cooked for seven days, quickly so as not to let the base patina dry, but carefully, I placed a positive watercolor heart on the base patina, sprayed both samples with an ammonia salt solution, letting one sample cook for two hours and the other sample for 14 hours. Let dry for one hour, soaked in warm water, let fully dry, And the result? Interesting. Two very, very different patinas. And I found more green. I also cooked up some other solutions. Watered down soy sauce, vinegar and salt, and water and salt. Now those are some nice solutions, which inspired me to cook more samples. I think this patina best illustrates the truly one-of-a-kind nature of patinas. I don't believe I could exactly reproduce even one of these patina results, no matter how closely I follow the recipe. When playing with patinas, it's important to expect that a specific patina recipe can yield a range of effects. Although you can't expect to recreate the exact patinas in this video, you can expect a predictable range of results with each patina recipe. My advice to you is make a few samples, play with patinas, and get a feel for them. Then play with your flowers. Or you could just jump in and start making flowers. If you end up with something you don't like, stare at it for a few days and see if it grows on you. Could happen. If it doesn't, 
emery it off, and start over. But don't forget to suit up for safety. Be sure to wear a dust mask. You don't want to breathe in patina dust. Don't give up. Learn from each patina. Don't forget to share on our Creating Linus Facebook page.